This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Good morning, everybody. It's a fabulous morning in Perth. I hope you're experiencing the same thing around Australia. A pretty hot week last week, um, but this week... Uh, it's uh, looking good for being in the garden. So I hope you get a little bit of time in the garden every day. Um, I'm Joanne Harris. Uh, I'm filling in for Trevor at the moment uh, for this week while he has a well-earned break. Um, so we've got a great show for you coming up today. Uh, we've got um, from Garden Express. Once again, we've got a fabulous offer from them. I'm surprised. Every week I see the offers coming in from Garden Express. They've not only got fantastic plants um, and things to offer, the offers they give are genuinely really good. So have a look at that. David Van Berkel is going to join us in the show and he'll let us know what that offer is later on. Uh, I'm going to share my plant of the week. It's a, it's a great little Christmas um, idea for you. And then um, uh, I've also got some tips on um, lawns. So if you've got a problem with your lawns this, um, this summer or if you've had problems in the past, um, I've got some tips that might help you, that's for sure. Um, of course, uh, we're here to answer all your gardening questions. Um, so if you've got any questions or queries, let's get those into the comments section and um, don't forget to uh, share us a like also. Um, look, I know that what we ask for also is that we um, a, a suburban state. It's going to make it a lot easier for me to assist um, you with um, directing the, the question where it should be uh, for you. But um, could you also, I'm not Trevor. I'm the rookie here today and uh, Trevor knows what the soil's like in every state and every suburb, I'm sure. I don't. Could you possibly also add in what sort of soil you've got? And that way, if I don't know your suburb, I can better direct the answer for you. Um, we've also got, as always, some great, from Mr. Fothergles, some great seed packets here. So get your questions in into the comment section for your chance um, to something. So let's move on straight away and get some uh, questions answered for you. And the first one is from Gail. Gail has sent us in a photo and I think um, we'll have that photo up on the screen for you as well. Thank you. And um, look, Gail, I had a look at the photo and it was a little bit hard to tell what it might have been. However, um, if you notice the leaves are a little bit yellow, I'm not sure when this photo was taken. If it was taken in the cooler parts or if you're, say, in Tasmania and it's much cooler, you might find that the yellow leaves are purely from the weather. However, it can also be a lack of trace elements. So um, I would suggest instead of trying to work out which particular trace element it is and then finding that you put that on but you make an imbalance, you might want to have a look at just doing a straight trace elements and do a um, get one of the ones that can foliage feed and that will certainly help it. Now, I, th I have a feeling though that's not what you're inquiring about. I think what you're asking about was the passion fruit. Um, and the fruit, I can see that it's got a mark around the band of it. I have to be honest, I haven't seen an issue with a passion fruit like this unless it's actually been a rodent. So it could possibly be um, a rat that has, or a, a rodent of some sort that's come in and nibbled. I'm surprised also though that it hasn't gone into the fruit. I guess because it looks like it's not particularly ripe yet, uh, they perhaps have moved on to something riper. I know when I've picked my mandarins 
and I reach up high and pick what I think is a fabulous mandarin. As I pick it off the tree, it collapses in my hand uh, because the rats or the rodents have gone in, they've made a small hole and gone in and eaten the fruit. But I still think it could well be rodents. If you don't think it's a rodent, can you send us another photo with it more, uh, with it closer up, and we'll give that another go and see if we can help you with that. Um, however, get some trace elements onto it and foliage feed, and that would be good. Um, okay, so Jono, who's in Perth. Hey, Jono. Um, he has asked, what plow flowers or plants would I re recommend planting in the semi-shaded area? You know, there's a, a lot of difference between shade also. So you can have shade that's very dank, shade that's dappled, shade that's got hot wind, shade that's a, a cold area. So it depends on what you've got. You really need to pinpoint that down a little bit further for me able to give you the actual ones. But I can give you some ideas of things that I rather like for shade. Um, Arthropodium, the New Zealand rock lily, I absolutely love. And will go in a dappled shade. It won't go in an extremely um, dark shade or dank shade. You'll have problems with that. But uh, Arthropodium, very pretty, and it flowers around this time of the year. So you've always got something for Christmas on your Christmas table, a few Arthropodium um, spikes. Clivia is a great one, or Clivia. Um, and White Lurio, I love in the shade. I've got underneath my weeping uh, mulberry the white lurio with the um, orange and the darker pink um, clivia looks fantastic and the flowers, the lurio flowers really well. I know here in Perth where it's hot and dry uh, you find that often the lurio will look very um, tattered at the ends and also will get a, uh, the snails to hibernate in them. So throw your snail pellets in there and that's where you'll hit them. So if you're wanting something more in a shrub line, um, John, have a look at something like the Exora. Um, even gardenias will grow well. And the Plectranthus is a beautiful one to try. That's the, um, what com is commonly known as the Mona Lavender. But uh, that's really pretty with the lavender flower. Um, and of course, if you're in an even darker area or lighter, but in a darker area, look at some of the philodendrons. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Um, there's also, if you're looking at bedding plants, look at something like begonias. Um, they do pretty well in the shade also. So I hope that fills up your garden with some, um, some pretties and look, looks really good in the shaded area. Um, then we're moving on to Janine. And Janine's from Allenbrook. Allenbrook's a suburb um, just north of, of the city, northeast, I guess you'd call it. Um, relatively new suburb. Now, we've got a photo for Janine's also. Yep, there it is there. That's part of the photo. Um, so the photo is showing that what I think might be wrong there, um, Janine, she has a passion fruit that's gone gone from green and gorgeous to wilting and looking like it's going to die. She wants to know if she could salvage it and it's only a two-year um, tree, uh, vine at least. Um, passion fruit can be very susceptible in their early years. And I'm wondering if the um, problem that you've got there on the vine, on the stalk of the vine, is perhaps a... Um, a collar rot. Uh, they can be really uh, susceptible to it. Uh, passion fruit don't like to have a huge amount of water. Like they don't like to be overwatered. It's hard one. It's a bit of a conundrum. They like a, a good amount of water to set fruit, but if you give them too much water, then something like collar rot uh, can affect them. And I've got to. Sus I suspect that might be. I do notice that right next to the stem, you've put what looks like maybe a dripper. Um, if you pull that out, pull it further out from the vine and feed the, the root system slightly further away from the vine is always a good idea. I think it's way too close to the vine to start with. Um, and the other thing, by looking at the second part of the photo that's just been put up, thanks very much, guys. Um, it uh, Originally, I thought, well, it was, oh, excuse me, it was a terribly hot week last week and it may have been that you had underwatered your vine and this could just simply be sunburn but when I looked then at the second what was the second photo for me um, at the collar rot um, it could well be that so I think you need to perhaps have a look and see whether that is collar rot 
Um, and you can tell sometimes by when you first planted it or soon after you planted it, it may well have had some splitting in the stem um, and that would show it. And you can actually um, just get a, a very sharp little knife and dig into those splits and see if there's a grub in there. It's called a ginger weave. Um, and if you see that, then you're fairly well assured that you've got it. They may have come and gone. So, um, yeah, but have a look at that. Um, unfortunately, it might mean that the best thing for you to do now is um, pull this vine out and start again. Not good news, but if you want to try that, that would be good. Okay, so then um, we have Joanne. Ah, Joanne. Joanne was from last week, and it was a question that I couldn't answer or I got a little bit confused when I was trying to answer it. And Joanne asked... Um, Joanne asked, um, she's uh, been told not to grow things under a callistamin. Um, is that true? And is there any way of making the plant more, um, more plant friendly? There certainly is. Um, and you're quite right. Um, some people, um, last week when I, I uh, couldn't answer it or didn't answer it, was I was a little confused because I, I know that there's a number of um, plants that you see and there's nothing under it not even a weed growing under a callistamin but then um, I've also seen callistamins with plants growing under them and I couldn't remember what they were completely and I didn't want to give you the wrong answer so I went away and had a bit of a think about it had a look up and spoke to a couple of the girls that I women that I work with also and one of them actually said oh I have uh, things growing under my callistamin and she grows sweet potatoes Another one has broms growing under some cholestamins, some taller tree-like cholestamins. Um, and um, then it's also said that things like some arthropodiums and even ginger will grow under it. I'm not quite sure about that. but they, So perhaps what you're looking for is yellow-rooted plants and maybe building up the soil above it. But just to give you a little bit more of an information, the plant in its root system does exude um, what they commonly call a natural weed killer. So it's like a herbicide. And in fact, um, I think it's in the United States, they're developing um, a herbicide um, and it's uh, called Callisto is the actual extract that they take from the callistamin. Um, so yes, it does kill off things and you will often see that there's not a weed underneath your callistamins, even though some further out in your garden. Um, and that's why. So I think really when it comes down to it, Joanne, you need to look at um, look at shallow rooted plants if you're wanting to underplant them. Um, otherwise, you could even consider a really nice pot garden, you know, say three or four nice little terracotta pots with some natives that are flowering at the time. You could even have, say, six pots. Some are flowering this season, some will flower next season. So you're constantly updating your garden in that way. That can, that can look really good. Okay. So, um, look, it, uh, it may feel like a long way from spring um, and we're certainly in the heat of summer over here in, in Perth um, and you always need to be planning ahead. Um, and so before Trevor went away, he had a chat with um, the wonderful David uh, Van Berkel about the beautiful spring bulbs. So let's take a look at that clip and see what's available for you um, and in preparation. It won't be long before you, you're planting them out. So have a look. David Van Berkel is joining us this morning, mate. You are a legend when it comes to bulbs. Garden Express have been supplying people with bulbs or your family has for generations. Nobody knows them better. And probably it's it's highly likely that if somebody's got flowering bulbs in their garden, they have come through Garden Express, isn't it? Yeah, very likely, Trevor. We're, uh, we've been involved with uh, with flower bulbs for uh, well, since my grandparents came out, and that's almost 70 years ago. Um, growers of tulips and hyacinths and uh, many more since then. And of course, right at the moment, people are starting to experience the summer flowering bulbs, the calla lilies, the hippies, hopefully they've got them in flower. Um, it, it's that time of the year for summer. But what most people sort of don't do is they don't understand they've got a plan ahead. So we should be thinking about spring pretty much in the next month or so, shouldn't we? Yeah, absolutely. Like through through spring, you're seeing all those beautiful golden daffodils and freesias and, and all of the delights of the spring flowering bulbs, which is a massive range, Trevor. 
And so we sort of bring that while it's fresh in people's minds to be planting their gardens, leaving a bit of space to add some of those in, and even some of your pots, you know. But in order to get in early, we throw in a, a nice discount to, uh, to get our, um, our season prepared and confirm all of our commitments to, uh, to stock. So you, you've got, obviously you've got the bulbs are in the ground growing now or about to start resting. And I always say gardeners are visionary people. And the reason I say it is because we are always thinking one, two, maybe even three seasons ahead. We're planting a tree, we're thinking 20 years ahead. We can see the beauty of the things that we want to put in. But anybody who's not, you know, really into gardening and, and doesn't understand the seasons, it's this is why you rely on somebody like Garden Express to help you out because you guys are sharing effectively the the knowledge of when to plant. So now is the time to be thinking about those tulips and daffs and you know all your spring flowering bulbs that are going to look sensational in sort of that depending on where you are in the country July, August, September, you know October and hopefully even into November. Um, so if you're thinking about the, the bulbs you love that time of the year now, now is the time to be placing the orders with you guys, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it avoids the scramble, Trevor. Like if you start to think about your garden and you haven't put enough time into it, you start not being able to get the varieties that you're after. But Mm -hmm. uh, as with all of the the, the shopping experiences these days, we like to take the time to consider our purchase. And as you say, with gardeners, you've either seen it in somebody else's garden and you want it. So nothing Mm -hmm. better than going out a bit early and, uh, and getting yourself organised and, and placing your pre-order. Remembering that the bulbs have just finished their season, so we know what the quality is like, we know what the growth habits has been, whether it's going to be a good crop or a bad crop. Um, yeah. And so we, we sort of have all of those preparations coming for a harvest just around Christmas time and after uh, yeah. and supply of the bulbs in February. Okay, so if people jump online to gardenexpress.com.au now, you can pre-order your bulbs knowing that in February, early, mid-February, you're going to get your delivery arrive. Exactly. And if you spend $50, the delivery is free. Delivery is free? Delivery of the spring bulbs is free. So that way, if you're placing an order, if you want to get some Christmas gifts or something to be shipped now, the pre-order of spring flowering bulbs will be shipped in February. And if you spend $50 or more on spring flowering bulbs, we'll ship them to you for free. And you're saving 20 to 50% off last season's prices. I know, too good to be true. It sounds like, doesn't it? It does. I'm wondering if I'm a smart guy in the back of my brain here. But... <laughs> Do you need to go back and just check with Rowan that maybe we didn't make a, there's a slight calculation error there? That's, a, that's an no, amazing. No, it's, it's all good. Spring bulbs, uh, you know, they're, they're a great product. There's lots of them. And, um, and we like to go out early, earn a little bit of money over Christmas and, mm-hmm. and give people that, uh, that surprise that's coming a little bit later and get that encouragement for people to, uh, to be preparing their gardens. Okay, it's great advice. Now, listen, David, what we will do is let's touch base again on the spring flowering bulbs that as people start to get their pre-orders in and talk about what they should do to ensure they're going to get the best results when they get them into the ground. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds fantastic. So uh, what you want to do is just be preparing your soil, put a bit of compost and uh, and any of the manures that you want to put in, fertilisers, let that all settle into the garden bed. About six weeks before your bulbs arrive. So yeah. if you were to start that around, you know, just after Christmas over the holiday break, you know, you can prepare your soil, prepare your garden bed, ready to put your spring bulbs in. Now, it's great preparation notes, and we'll talk about what they do with the bulbs when they arrive in February. Now, listen, I just want to confirm this just to make sure we've got it right. You've got 20 to 50% off off last season's pricing, which is crazy, um, for spring flowering bulbs and order $50 or more, and they're going to be delivered free. Absolutely. You, you do You, you do have me questioning... <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've done this for a long time, Trevor. It's a really, uh, it's a really good season for us. Obviously, over the Christmas break, we're, we're reluctant to be shipping too many plants in the heat of summer. Uh, uh-huh. So this is a really good way to keep engaging with our customers uh, and, and offer them a ripper deal, you know, just coming into Christmas when everything's so expensive. And um, as we said, prepare your gardens, get ready for this blooming colour.
I love it, mate. Well done. Great deal, folks. If you want to take up what is going to be a sensational deal, and I'm sure those prices won't last once we get into the season seriously. You'll be paying full prices, I'm sure. Now, it's gardenexpress.com.au. Jump online. Check out, check out the details on what bulbs are available and place your orders now. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe online there's a little flip book. So you can kind of go through it like an old catalogue, flip through yep. the pages and have a look at all the things that are on offer without having to scroll through each of the images. Um, so it's a good way to have a, have a bit of a preview of what's coming up for spring. And it's a bit of a limited range here. Um, we've got about 12 pages when normally we would have, you know, 60 pages of spring bulbs. But get in early, folks. David, thanks very much. That's another great deal. You're a bloody legend, mate. Having a lot of fun with it, Trevor. Great talking to you. It's great to uh, plan ahead and see what you're going to produce for next spring. I guess um, the tip to remember there also is don't plant your bulbs. If you're in Perth, don't plant your bulbs too early. It's too hot in February, March. You can, they're available then and you can certainly get them from Garden Express now and onwards. Um, but plant them later in the year. So um, I tend to look at the beginning of May, sometimes end of April. Um, and for, for tulips, uh, definitely the end of May. However, look, thanks very much for sending in all your questions. We're getting lots of questions in today and it's great to hear from you all. Um, if you're enjoying what you're watching, give us a like. And um, don't forget, if you could give us your suburb and state, uh, would be fantastic. And then I can uh, uh, understand a little bit more about uh, what your need is in your garden. Um, and also, if you can give us the soil type that you have, that's even better. I can... Um, then direct the answer much more. It'll be tailor-made for you. Um, so I guess this time of the year, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is lawns. Um, my lawn, I'm really proud of it this year. It's, uh, it's uh, going really well. And um, I've got some tips on lawns um, soon program. In the meantime, uh, we're going back to B and B's from Jin Jin in Queensland. So it's kind of mid northern Queensland, isn't it? Why are we? Why are my massive pumpkin vines setting fruit that only gets as big as a teacup, then dies and falls off the vines? And yet the vines look very healthy. That's a really frustrating thing um, to happen. Look, pumpkins are pretty much 100% water, so I would think that you need to water them um, more, and you'd get a much better a vine. I think. Um, if you can solve the plant nutrition and watering puzzle um, for your garden, uh, half your problems are going to be solved. So I think have a look at the watering regime and um, that should help you be. So uh, Deborah, Deborah's from Balladura, which is not very far away from um, where I live. balladura has got very sandy soil there. Um, it's a lovely little suburb. Um, I have some red spider mite and cobwebs on my rose. And what she can, what can she do? Yeah, red spider mites a pain, but it's good that you've noticed it. Um, you can spray for spider mite. Um, I like a product. It's a natural product, uh, and it's called EcoFend, um, and it's very good um, for spider mite. Do it. Um, I think mites have a fourteen day uh, life cycle, so make sure that you spray it. Um, on a cooler day, like this week is perfect. Um, and you can spray uh, this morning um, with your, your eco fan tomorrow morning if you buy some today. And then leave it for, say, 12 days and spray it again. Spray under the leaf and on top of the leaf as well. Um, spider mites hate cold water in the middle of the day. So you could grab your hose and hose them off also. That'll certainly help. Um, but, yeah, it's... Excuse me, it's definitely worth um, uh, treating those because if you let them go, it will affect the plant considerably. Um, so, hey, Tyson's back. Tyson's in Baronia in Victoria and he's asking if he's got any advice on planting strawberries from seed. Um, look, Tyson, uh, put your strawberry plant, your seeds in. I would um, perhaps germinate them in a uh, seed raising mix first. And then when they become 
let's say three centimetres, four centimetres big, then you could transplant them out into pots and then out into your garden. It really depends on what your environment is like, Tyson, as to how quickly you can put them into your garden. But um, again, keep those um, relatively uh, moist but well-draining soil and then transplant them into the garden. Give them mulch and, of course, mulch underneath will help keep um, some of the plants, uh, some of the, the bugs and things like slaters and so forth away also. Um, I love planting them into hanging baskets. They look fantastic and um, it keeps them away from a lot of the bugs, the crawling bugs that do affect the um fruit of the berries. Thanks for your question uh, there, Tyson. Um, Namala is from Perth um, and her ericene is losing all its leaves even though I've put it in the shade and giving it ample water. Right. We've had a lot of hot wind last, last week um, and really hot temperatures. It could be that it's just dried out from that um, and therefore it's dropping its leaves and showing that evidence. Or it could be that you are giving it ample water, but you're actually giving it too much water. Um, these will rot quite quickly, especially in the shade. Now, because we grow them in the shade, the, um, the soil does always dry out as, as what we return with our hose or with our reticulation and turn it on. So check the ground, check the water to see, uh, sorry, check the, the soil to see how wet that is. And if it's wet, don't water them. Uh, leave them for the next day and go out and check them again. Again, as I say, if we can get our watering and nutrition puzzle for your garden right, you've got half your problems are solved. So I um, hope that helps you there, Nimar. Um, Sander is from the central coast in New South Wales. And how, does, uh, how do I get rid of all the tiny flying bugs on my plants? They're flying around my lounge room too. I suggest you are, you are suggesting that you've got, um, now I've gone completely blank, that you've got bugs that appear when you overwater a plant. Um, so, and what happened, and a lot of people, I see it, um, especially on Facebook, I see a lot of people giving their answers to how you can get rid of them. Um, and there are ways of getting rid of them. You can use neem oil on the plant. Uh, some people say if you put cinnamon on the top of your plant, that that will help with them. But basically, if you continue your watering practices the way you are, if you continue to overwater a plant, then you will continue to have the, the bugs. And I've still gone blank and can't find that word. However, um, reduce the watering and I'm sure that you'll find they'll go away. Um, I was sitting at my uh, dining table the other day and I had two plants that I know I'd overwatered, and all of a sudden out they come, the gnats, and there they are. So just reduce the watering and they should go away nicely for you. Um, so thanks, Sand. Appreciate your um your uh, question. It's, it's a good one. A lot of people have those little flying bugs around their lounge room also. Um, so I was talking before about lawns. got a little bit excited and jumped to that. Um, I really enjoy uh, this year the fact that my lawn is looking lush and green. I want to say it's emerald green. I'm not sure about that. But it's a beautiful lush green at the moment. And I think it's because I've been doing a couple of things that um, might help you as well. Um, look, the traditional lawn food that we used to use on lawns um, would all of a sudden you'd, you'd place it, you'd put it on, and within the next couple of days you've got this beautiful green lawn, right? And it would dump lots of nitrogen down into the soil, and that's the it would produce the green. Um, however, within the next couple of weeks, especially in the summertime you find that then the lawn starts to regress and go back to what it was. You're getting patches in it, it's got dryness, um, and it's not, not growing so well, unevenly, etc. cetera. Um, and then you also have, so that's the traditional um, old-fashioned uh, fertiliser. And then the newer ones that have come out over the last few years um, react more with the, the root system, right? So, and it's good. You don't necessarily see the greenness. So it can be a bit disappointing if that's what you're expecting but what it's doing is it's building up a fabulous root system and therefore no matter how hot it gets um, and how little water you want to put or, or less water that you 
uh, can afford to put on it um, or allowed to put on it if you're in restrictions, um, the root system will support the growth at the top. And that's what's really important right, to your lawn. So what we've found, though, is a product that I've um, had a look at and started using. It's the Scott's Lawn Builder Extreme Green. All right, it's, um, it's a fantastic fertilizer because it's taken both of those. So it not only dumps a high soluble nitrogen, which is available to all the grasses immediately. So after the application within, you know, just maybe three days, you're going to get this lovely lush green look about your lawn. But it's also going to truly, in a controlled manner, fertilize your lawn over the next three months. And that then works on the root system. So you get a nice strong lawn, um, but you've also got this lovely lush lawn. You know, quite honestly, it's Christmas coming up. And I know we're all talking about what we can buy for Christmas and offers for Christmas. But this is one of the best things you can do for your lawn. You can have it before Christmas, uh, before all the relatives hit your backyard. You've got a nice lush green to show off. Um, look, it's also got uh, point five of a percent of phosphorus so it can be used i can talk to you anywhere in australia and you can use this um, legally and well um, so there's also um, that's the granular one um, now look the four kilo bag um, that i picked up has uh, will cover um, 250 square meters um, it's safe for children and dogs to walk on it also um, and it's suitable for all types of lawns um, as well as lawn substitutes, you're looking at lipia, dichondra, zoysia, all of those sorts of things. It's going to work for all of them. So that's great. If any of you are sitting on some of the lawns that I've seen recently after the hot, hot weather that we've been having, um, and you've got really bad uh, yellowing in the lawn and a crispy lawn, you might want to try the same product but in the liquid form. So it's a one litre bottle and it's you click it on with your hose and then you hose it in. So it's foliage feeding, which means that it's going to react nice and fast for you also. So it does all the same things. Again, it's only 5% phosphorus, so it's safe for right around Australia. Um, even uh, for the likes of me, I live close to Swan River and we've got this beautiful river running right through our city. None of us want to use high phosphorus uh, because then it causes all sorts of environmental damage. Um, so this is one to certainly, um, to certainly look at. Now, the one litre bottle actually covers 180 square metres. Your lawn will quickly absorb it given that it's going through the beds of grass, so it will not only feed the root system, it'll feed through the, the grass itself. So you'll have a whole heap of change really quickly. The one thing I guess, so that's the, the um, that's the, sorry, Scott's Lawn Builder uh, Extreme in the granular and also in the liquid thing, the liquid formula. What I want you to consider though, is whatever you do, with your lawn if you don't use a wetting agent first it will not absorb the fertilizer in so try and make sure that you get a wetting agent onto it and then use the scots lawn builder extreme green right so that's that's my tip for your lawn before christmas um Okay, on last week's episode uh, of the Garden Gurus, Nigel showed us how to actually use this uh, lawn builder, uh, the Extreme Green. So have a look at this clip. I'm sure you're all familiar with the expression, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, but it doesn't have to be, especially if you give yours a good dose of fertilizer. Getting on the front foot and fertilizing now, before the weather really warms up, will give your grass that extra boost of nutrients it needs so it's strong and healthy going into summer. Amazing. Imagine the scene, you've got a barbecue in three days time and you need impact from your lawn so it's looking sassy on the day. Well, you're in luck, folks. With Lawn Builder Extreme Green, you can green up your lawn in just three days time, but you better be quick. 
It's got iron and magnesium to feed your lawn and also extra nitrogen for fast, extreme greening. The unique time-released formula helps develop a strong lawn and root system and feeds over a three-month period rather than one big dump. Being low in phosphorus means it can be safely used anywhere in Australia without posing any risk to ground or surface water. The recommended application rate is a low 16 grams a square metre, and the best way to apply is with one of these handheld spreaders or one of these larger push spreaders, or in Trev's case, he's got the four-wheel buggy contraption, but then you see he has got a big block. Now, watering in straight after application will activate the fertiliser, because remember, folks, you've only got three days to the barbie and by then the Sorry about that. We had a, a little technical issue there, but uh, the wonderful tech has sorted us out and we're back on again. So um, I've bought a little plant today uh, for you. The, my plant of the week this week is a hydrangea. Um, hydrangeas are fantastic plants um, for around Christmas time. They can you, you can use them inside, um, yours in, um, I know I've got a couple in my lawn, uh, living room at the moment that look fantastic. Um, and then you can plant them out after Christmas. They go well in pots, etc. They do take a bit of water. They do take, they do need some shade also. So here in Perth, we have to be particularly careful where we put them. The hot wind again, I know I keep banting on about the hot wind, but it really does have its effect at this time of the year. Um, however, what I've bought is something, it's a new release. It's a new release in Perth. You people are in the Eastern States may have had it last year, um, but this, I'm not sure about that even, but this year we have brought in um, a new plant and it's called Miss Seori. It's a, um, it's a, the most beautiful little, um, I'll put that closer so you can see the flowers. Um, these flowers um, are a little bit old now, so they're a little bit more paler than what you would normally see. Um, so they have uh, faded down, um, but they're fantastic. They're a double flower, um, layer upon layer. It's actually a white petal with the um, margins, with the, the pink around them. The thing you notice also about this one is that the leaves have this beautiful bronzing colour. So they start out quite green and then they change into this bronze. Um, you know, a hydrangea um, is, is a, um, a really popular thing to be given at Christmas time. So if you want something really pretty, something to give to a friend, a neighbour, a relative, even in your Kris Kringle, um, something like this is a fantastic. Make sure your garden centre gift wraps it for you, makes it look really even prettier. Um, and it's a great photo. Uh, it's a great plant. Um, okay, so this one, uh, the this particular unique bicolour uh, range is also known to grow in the sun, not in the shade. In fact, if you're in Victoria or uh, even uh, Sydney, you don't want to put this in the shade. It's not going to grow. It will die. Um, I found that really hard to believe when I first saw them come through and had them uh, and the promotion was that they were for full excuse me, full sun, um, I had a, a question of that. And so I spoke with the grower himself and he said, yes, last year they grew them all in the shade and they lost the entire batch. So this year they've thrown them in, they've grown them in, um, in, the, in the full sun, but full morning sun. Um, I would suggest that full morning sun is all that I would give it. 
um, I might eat my words and, and find that it grows in uh, a little bit of afternoon sun too. But I think our afternoon sun, especially from this time on into March, is going to be really harsh on it. So perhaps um, in the uh, in morning sun would be a way to go. And maybe try it in a pot to start with so that you don't lose it. If you see that it's suffering, excuse me, and not liking the position you put it in, you can move it. However, great, you'll find these in all the garden centres at the moment. There will be white ones, this one certainly the Missiori, but then also you find white ones and blue ones, etc. One thing with this too is when you buy a blue hydrangea or a purple hydrangea, it's generally being grown in an acid soil. When you grow a pink, it's in an alkaline soil, whereas this particular range doesn't change. So whether your soil is acid or alkaline, it will um, stay the same colour you purchased it. It will fade down as the plant, as the flowers fade. And I'm afraid we sold so many at the garden centre yesterday. This was the only one left which had the faded flowers. So I'm sorry I couldn't bring you on with a little bit more. Um, yeah, so just remember that they need um, adequate water, hydrangeas, hydro. Um, and um, otherwise, they're a, a fabulous plant to grow. Um, yeah, so get down to your garden centre, get one of those. And as I said before, get them to gift wrap it for you. They'll do a beautiful job and uh, that'll certainly uh, thrill somebody. Okay, um, so can you believe it? The uh, season of the Garden Guru is, is the weekend and it's the finale. So we're at the end of the season again. Um, Take a look at the promo. It's uh, featuring my good friend, Darren Senior. Check out this range of pop-up plant covers. They make growing your favorite ornamentals and productive plants so much easier. For more information, make sure you catch us on The Garden Gurus this weekend. Hi, back again. So, uh, Bob from Mount Lawley. Mount Lawley is an inner suburb of Perth and um, where Bob has asked the question, um, new, he's new to worm farming and is it necessary to di dilute the worm tea and castings before distributing to my garden? Um, the castings not so much, although I tend to mix those into the soil as I'm putting them in, just you know, scraping them over rather than um, putting them straight down into the root system or right at the, the trunk of, of a plant. Um, as far as the worm tea goes, yes, Bob, definitely dilute it. I usually dilute it only by a third, um, so that, that should work for you. It's great stuff. It's, it's good for the garden. Don't forget it's not a full balance. It's like honey sandwiches every day is not good for you. You need a balanced diet. So do plants. So this is certainly very good, but also consider some mineral fertilizers, some microbes in it, and that'll help the soil as well as the plant. Okay, so then um, we're on to Sandra. And unfortunately, Sandra hasn't let us know where she is from. Um, and what flowers do native string, um, the stingless bees love? Is it only flowers on native shrub trees? No, it's not. The natives are fantastic uh, for pollinators, but you're also, there's certain things that flower really well. Um, in my garden, I have a number of natives, but I have a real passion for selvias. They flower a lot through the year and they certainly attract in the bees. Um, there's a perennial basil that um, I personally don't like the taste of perennial de basil when I'm cooking with it or using it in a salad, but it is never without a bee around it and all bees are attracted to it. So um, yeah, go out and see if you can find um, maybe a, um, a perennial uh, basil or some salvias, anything that's got lots of flowers. And I try and have flowers in my garden most of the year. I know when you have the, that change and all of a sudden it goes from nice cool weather to very hot weather, you often don't have as many flowers in the garden that they die down and then that you're waiting for the next lot to come up. Just try and keep them happening all the time and you'll be providing bees with some great pollinators. Okay, um, thanks Sandra. Uh, uh, we've got Sue Ellen and she's from Broadford, Victoria. And I'm sorry, Sue Ellen, I have no idea where that is. But thank you. You've put it here. You're in a cool zone and with clay soil. And she's after a native to fill a spot in three to four metres high, two to three metres wide. Can you advise me what might be, might, might be suitable? 
first thing that comes to mind is a plant we were talking about earlier is the cholestamine. Um, and you could certainly look at um, most of the cholestamines will do well in clay soil and they're all frost tolerant. So maybe a cholestamine. There are a number of grevilleas that will um, grow in clay soil. Um, and there's a number of, um, of uh, natives that, you know, predominantly grow in a sandy soil. But, you know, if you're in clay soil, what you can do is mound up your soil, mound up that particular area and um, add in some good compost to the soil that's um, good for native compost, uh, good for the natives. And then you can plant something that is perhaps a little bit shallower rooter, so it's not going to go down into the clay as much, but it will um, still grow within it. So your options are perhaps more than what you think there. Um, thanks very much. Now, um, Greg in Parkerville. Ah, Parkerville, New South Wales. I was thinking Parkerville up in the hills here in, in uh, Perth. Um, and Greg wants to know how um, his almonds are ready to pick. Um, that's if the birds don't get them first. <laughs> that's such a pain isn't it? when the birds come in and you think, there's my crop, it's great, and you go out. And if it's, you know, your palm fruit or something, they're just completely eaten, half eaten. Or if it's the nuts, they've taken them away completely. Um, look, over the summer months, you'll find, usually find around early January, um, there'll be the hull will start to split. And that's how you generally know that they... Um, they will uh, be ready. It, the shell should be visible through the split in the hull and the nut in itself will begin to dry. Um, eventually the junction between the stem and the tree will weaken um, and that, that's when you know that it's ready to harvest. And harvest generally occurs between say February, April, depending on where you're living in Australia and the thing, but generally around about that time. Uh, good question, uh, Greg. So now we're off to Singleton in WA. Singleton's just south of Perth and it's um, on the beach. Uh, it's right near the beach, so very sandy soil. Um, and Melissa has asked, we have been growing a lily pilly resilience hedge successfully and would love to propagate it. We've tried many times without success, so do you have any tips? Um, we made sure to make cuttings thicker than pencil and tried a rooting hormone as well, but nothing has worked. Um, my understanding is they need to be thicker than a pencil. Look, I'm not a grower. I'm a retailer. So um, I'm not, this is not my forte. Uh, but my understanding is that um, it needs to be a slightly thinner um, than that. I would also um, cut the, um, make sure that you've got at least one lot of leaf nodes between it. Cut the leaf in half, use some hormone and put it into some good soil. Um, and it should take off. I don't know that they're that hard but um, to grow, but I think what you're trying to do is do it with hardwood rather than softwood. And um, I'm going to check on this that I'm telling you the correct answer and I'll come back next week if I've told you the wrong one, Melissa. But I think maybe that's one of the things that is um, one of the reasons why it's not working for you. Good luck with those. The thing with the resilience, it's a really good one to have because it's um, resilient to the ciliate. You may still get a few on it, but you're less likely to have all those little bumps in your leaves with the, the um, ciliate underneath. Um, easy to deal with once you've got it, if you deal with it on a regular basis. But by using the resilience, you're cutting out half your work, which is great. Um, okay, so um, Vinette. Vinette's also in Perth. When it's the best time to ver when is it the best time to fertilize my long potted fruit trees? I'm confused about conflicting advice given don't fertilize when flowering because flowers fall off and not when fruiting for the same reasons. You're absolutely right for both of those things. Um, and if you over fertilize, that's what's going to happen, or if you fertilize. Look, um, I grow some things in pots, I grow some fruit trees in pots, and you will fertilize them in um, autumn and then again in spring coming into winter for some good growth. There's no point fertilizing anything um, that is shut down over the winter time and most fruit trees do slow down and shut down um, and don't absorb the soil. All they need is moisture to keep their roots healthy. Um, it's hard to know what, like I prefer a, um, and really like to fertilize with 
um, something like EcoVital or GrowSafe. It has great um, or Troforte. It's got really good minerals in the in the uh, fertilizer as well as microbial. So what you're doing there is you're feeding the soil as well as feeding the plants. If the soil is full with lots of microbial activity then you'll find that your plants will survive a lot longer in the same potting mix. And let's let's face it, you don't really want to um, start repotting your plants every year or even every second year. And if they're in something, a big enough vessel to grow a fruit tree in, um, then that's going to make it more difficult. So the other, the other thing that you can use also to replenish your soil is sea salt. Um, so think about feeding your soil as well as feeding your plants. Feed them in autumn, again in spring, um, and you should have a, a healthy plant. Um, okay, so that's Vinette from Perth. Um, so Jeanette, who in Canberra, and we all know where Canberra is, uh, my zucchini plant is taking over the veg plant. Is it okay to cut the leaves while the plants are flowering and fruiting? Um, yeah, it is okay. Don't take them all off but uh, can cut some of those leaves off and make room um, or even fold them back if you can is a good idea as well. But yes, you can. That's uh, it's a good question actually um, because zucchinis do tend to take over. I often will grow things underneath my zucchinis or close to them that then ends up spreading around them. Um, things like oregano, growing herbs and things around them is what I grow. And yes, I cut off some of the, the bottom leaves um, or fold them back and up under. All right. So Bunyip, or Bunyip, Victoria, I think it's more like. Um, regard lawns, if I use a weed and feed approximately four weeks ago, can I still apply extreme green now? Yeah, you can. And it'd be smart. And yes, you can. Um, just make sure, as I said, that you've got a good wetting agent, that your soil is absorbing the moisture, then it will still absorb um, the fantastic Scots product. Okay, so last question possibly, Collie. So we're off to Collie. Collie is in the southwest of West Australia and Callie's asking, my alcorns are looking great. Thank you for your help last week. I'm wondering why it is the best way to what is the best way to grow passion fruit? I've had one that came with the house, but it doesn't fruit. I'd love to grow another. Okay, um, so Collie is right on the border also where it can be a little bit cold for passion fruit. So it's good that you've got it, have it on the, the warm side of your house. Make sure that you've got it in, in some good sunshine. Um, uh, don't overwater it, um, but give it adequate water. Okay, that's a little bit of a you know, but give it adequate water. Um, then also uh, a, a good fertiliser is worth it. Don't dig under and around um, a passion fruit. They hate their roots to be disturbed. So that may help it. And one of the things that um, we've been selling recently uh, in the last few years is the West Australian Sunshine Special. It's a non-grafted passion fruit that produces very well. And my understanding is that the growers use this. Um, uh, the commercial growers for the vegetable market grow the Sunshine Special. Um, give that one a go when it's back on the market and I'm sure that you'll have uh, more success. The other thing you've got to consider is do you have enough pollinators around? So if you find that it is flowering but the flowers are dropping off, it may be that they're not pollinating well and that you need to attract more bees, more pollinators into your garden. Um, so grow some other things just a little bit away from your passion fruit, maybe some salvias, perennial basil, any of the native um, flowering plants will also help it. So anything that's flowering around about now in the, the late spring and early summertime, That'll certainly help it with it. And I hope you have good luck with it um, down there in Collie. Well, that's uh, wrapping up the show for this week. It's uh, been fantastic. It's nearly Christmas time. It's actually my last show until next year. Um, but, and if, but I'm really happy with all the questions that came through today. Thanks very much for them all. Um, I, I hope uh, you enjoyed watching the show as much as we appreciate you watching us. Um, and we hope you've enjoyed today's live stream. Um, wonderful producer, Lachlan. 
uh, we'll send out um, some the message uh, from all the questions that won some packets of seeds from uh, Mr. Fothergills this week. He'll be doing those today after today's show. Um, don't forget the Garden Gurus is back on Sunday. Um, it's the season finale this Saturday. Sorry, I said Sunday, didn't I? It's actually Saturday and the season finale is on. Make sure you check your local TV guide so you don't miss it. Uh, remember, you can always jump onto our website and catch up of any of our previous stories um, from The Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv or the YouTube channel with thegardengurus.tv. Um, you can listen back on today's show um, on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Audible um, and in, listen back to any of the shows. Um, Trevor will be back on next Monday uh, for the final for 2021 session of the Garden Gurus Live. That's at 12 p.m. Australian day, Eastern Daylight Time and 9 a.m. for the WA viewers. So that wraps me up for the year. I'd like to say a very Merry Christmas to all of you that do celebrate Christmas. Um, and thank you from all of us here at the Garden Gurus for today and a happy gardening, everyone.